God be the glory, great things he has done. Amen. So love ye the world that he gave us his son. <coughs> I think we need more of that in the message in the church today. I think we need more reminding of that in the church today. I think we're not careful, we're becoming more of churches in our nation that are more concerned about people's wishes and wants rather than preaching of the gospel. We're seeing churches attendance across the globe and especially in America on a decline. I believe a lot of it is because we have people that are being so deceived by the enemy that they're missing the light of the gospel. I believe we're also seeing men and women in the church. They're not heeding to the call of ministry in the way that they should. Toward the end times, the Apostle Paul, in addressing the church in Thessalonica, said that there would come a time where there would be a great falling away of the faith. He doesn't say that there would be a great falling away of the world because the world does and is doing exactly what the world is supposed to do understand that. That's the reason why it is, it is important to realize even the words of Christ is, and even in John is, may not these things catch you unaware because this is how it happens. But what we do mean, be mindful of is when there is a falling away from the faith. That means there is a falling away, a drifting away from the foundational truths of Christianity. And I believe we have seen an erosion in those in the last 50, 60 years. There has been a stark change in the way the gospel has been preached, the way church, church leadership have addressed issues since the 1960s. The sexual revolution of the 1960s not only brought a revolution to our nation, and to many parts of the world, but it brought a revolution also within the church, but not in a positive way. I believe we saw some rekindling of hope in the 1970s. Interesting statistic, in the 1970s, many of the top 10 songs of the time had something to do about Jesus Christ. There were songs that were being played on radios that were very much God-honoring. And many saw that as the Jesus. They called it the Jesus movement. And some of you were alive. I mean, I was, of course, a young child. Many of you were adults during that period of time. But then the abundance of the 80s happened. And with the abundance of the 80s, certain, suddenly Americans had money to spend and access to places to go, and we began to see a slight decline in overall church membership. But then it began to kind of kick back up a little bit in the 80s, and in the early 90s, it picked up. And even among 18 to 25-year-olds in the early 90s, things seemed to pick up pretty good, and the numbers were looking better. And then came the millennium. Then came the millennium, which brought into adulthood a group of people, children that are now adults, called millennials. And the millennial generation has been marked by a group that, have, that are interested in spiritual things. They have actually been interested in religious things, but that has not been reflected into the local church. So we have seen a slight decline and more and more and more. Now we have come into all of our, every young person in this church is Generation Z. The interesting thing about Generation Z is we see this generation and we see it in our church. They're much more interested in being about a cause. As a matter of fact, they are considered to be the entrepreneurial generation. Many of Generation Z will own their own businesses by the time they're 25 years old. And that's something. 
Many 17 and 18 year olds right now already have YouTube businesses. That blows me away. A friend of ours down in Orlando has a daughter who is Rebecca's age, and she has 64,000 followers on her YouTube channel. 64,000. She's 10. And what does she do? She does kids' toy reviews. Marketing to a generation. Because that's what Generation Z does. So what we have said as a church, okay, if they're all about a cause, we want to get them plugged into the cause of Christ. Amen. And we see that. We see that in our young people, from our littlest to our oldest. You know, it, we see that, and we're, we're like, we better catch this generation, because this is a generation, and, men, and I'll be honest with you, sociologists have called Generation Z the last generation. I don't know why they've actually called it that. One of the one of the speculations is from the church. Many believe that we're seeing the we're going to see the coming of the kingdom of God very soon. But from a sociological perspective, what we're seeing is because generations are changing so quickly that there are no longer ten and fifteen year gaps, but there are six to eight months at the most. So this generation Z may be the last classified generation by the old stylistic parameters of ten fifteen years. But what we have seen is this ever uh, slipping away from the faith. There's interest in spiritual things, and there's, in, there's interest in religion, but there's no interest in the local church or, act, or personal ministry. And one of the things that, have, that we see a lot of in our age today, in, in, with the advent of social media, is giving to organizations that are great organizations, but they're not the local church. We see a lot of Red Cross, for instance, Salvation Army. These are all great organizations. I'm not knocking these organizations, and there are others. But we are seeing a generation that is more apt to pour into those, their resources, than into the local church. Because what has happened is there's the view of the local church has shifted. And that has happened because we as adults, if we have raised, and, 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 you know, we're not care, we're raising a generation of children that do not put paramount importance upon the local church. And this is one of the reasons why a, a few years back, you know, some of us caught a lot of flack from it from some parents when we reduced the, when we got rid of children's church. Oh, how you know, the sky was falling because we got rid of children's church. But it began to really bother me as a pastor because our children were not in church. You were like, well, they were in children's church. That's not the same. I want my daughter to see me worshiping the Lord. I want your daughter, your son, your grandchildren, those of them that are here, I want them to see you worshiping the Lord. Because that is going to fulfill, a need. they're going to see daddy, they're going to see mama, they're going to see, they're going to see grandparents, they're going to see uh, family members, they're going to see friends serving and worshiping God. And that is going to instill something in them that we're not in another room. This is something to be a part of. Amen. And it is the local church. And the more we have segregated our children away, do you know it is sad to say that the most segregated day of the week in America is on Sunday? Now, you may immediately think racial segregation, and that is true. And that is so true. It's like all of a sudden every, every tribe and color forms its own body of believers. On Sundays, it happens. It's, it just has happened. But I'm more concerned about the fact that we split up our families in church. The very time when families need to be hearing the word of God together, we're pulling their children out. And in Sunday school, in a lot of church, you pull the husbands in one direction, wives in another. And you get to church and you never see each other as a family until you get back into the parking lot. And it sends a message, and I believe with all my heart, it has created something that we're reaping a bad benefit from now. Is that there's no, there, the value of the local church is not only becoming less in the mind of the world, but it's becoming less in the mind of the people of God. And that's, that is a fear, and you have heard me say this, it is a fear. I'm very concerned where the local church will be in 50 years. I'm very concerned. Should Jesus tarry this coming? Where the local church is going to be in 50 years? And part of this, I believe, is what we see Paul talking about in 2 Thessalonians. If you want to turn there real quick, we're going to go look at one verse, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Short little verse, but it's packed full of information. 
What Paul is addressing here is there was an issue going on within the church of Thessalonica of false teaching. And many times when you're reading the letters of Paul, that's what he is dealing with, with false teachers and correcting false teaching. And many of Thessalonica had believed, and if we look at it, is that, that, with, that to correct the errors concerning the end times that believers had heard from false teachers, that among the falsehood was that the day of the Lord had already come. And if we go back to 2 Thessalonians, in fact, in chapter 2, verse 2, he says, Not be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if, for, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, and we talked about that day is the coming of the Lord, will not come unless the falling away from comes first, and the man of sin is revealed in the son of perdition, who we understand to be the Antichrist. And then he goes on to describe the work of the Antichrist, which we've covered as we were talking about the Antichrist earlier in the series. But we get into verse 13, and he says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and belief of the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you are taught, whether by word or our, our epistle, whether by letter. In other words, he says, there are false teachers out there. You better stand firm on the word that you are reading and that we are preaching. And where does that happen but at the local church? Where does the teaching, we talked about this this morning, I, it was kind of it's kind of interesting how God brought these two messages together on the same day. That was not my plan. But they're so similar. They're like the same side of the same coin in so many ways. Because as much as this morning we want to celebrate membership, what does it mean to be a church member? To be something, part of something bigger than we are. But by the same token, this we have to have the local church as believers in Christ. It is where, as Paul said, it is where we hear, we read the teaching. It is where we hear the teaching because there's so much out there that is polar opposite. He said there are people out there telling you that the Lord has already come. That is not true. Listen to what we're telling you. And there are all kinds of, there's all kinds of stuff out there where they have reduced the blood of Jesus to like writing out a check. Holding God to his word. All these crazy things that come out. This name it, claim it religion that we're still bogged down in. I thought after the 80s we'd have gotten out of that. In the 90s it got a little bit better. We crossed into the millennium and it's like every bit of that preaching reignited again. And here it now, it's on satellite TV all over the planet. It's like it just took a back seat for a while, got up its gumption, and then was relaunched in a massive global way. And what we're telling Christians is you're not committed. Don't be committed. You don't have to be committed. You just, just believe, and that's true. We believe unto salvation, but once we believe unto salvation, it is, it is uh, James says that faith without works is dead. We work out our salvation, Paul said, with fear and trembling. But, and we don't earn it by our works, but people see God through our works, and they see the work of Christ through our work, so we've got to work. And how do we work? We work through the local church because we are better together. Because none of us can survive out there by ourselves. I, I, there are some of you in this sanctuary today who tried that. You tried it by yourself, and it didn't work. Because the people of God need the people of God. And I need, just like I told you today, I need this. I don't need to be preaching up here. But that's all I'm talking about. I need our church fellowship. I need that. I crave that. I miss it when I don't get that. But what we're seeing is we're seeing a culture that has said, you know what, we, we really don't put importance on the local church. You know, I, in my ministry alone, I have seen the clergy, now this may seem small, but it, it's not in my mind. Used to, whenever I went to visit a hospital, there was a clergy <laughs> parking spot there. One or two, sometimes even three. Because, and you could slip in there, that way you could get right in the hospital and visit people. Or if it's an emergency. Gone are those days. Now they just, they played it over. No longer are there clergy parking spots. Isn't that something? Did y'all realize that? People don't expect me to be missing things. They're not actually, but it's the world saying, you know what? We really don't care if the church shows up or not. 
There's no value to the church showing up or not. But because, unfortunately, we sometimes, I believe, as a church, have sent that message. That as long as we're up in our huddled up in our little four wall camps, we're okay. That's all we need. But the Bible says that there's going to come a time. And look what Paul says here. He says, let no one perceive you by any means that the day will come unless the falling away comes first. Jesus was the very first one to talk about this falling away. It's the word where we get our word apostasy. Or uh, the Greek word is apostasia. And it means a rebellion. And we think, well, you know what, rebellion, okay, uh, rebellion, kind of warfare. But let me go a little bit further about it. What does apostasy mean? It not only means rebellion, but it means an abandonment of the truth. An abandonment. That's where we are. When you start hearing professing priest Christians talk about their truth, we're in trouble. There's only one truth, and his name is Jesus. And church, I know I, sometimes I feel like I beat this to death, but I feel like if we're not, if we don't, we're going to slip into some place, or we're going to allow our families to slip, slip in some place where we're not supposed to be. <laughs> and part of it is holding on to the truth of the word of God. Israel, the Old Testament is laden with apostasy, where Israel would turn their back on God. And stray away from the teachings of the Lord. And any time you saw apostasy, you saw idolatry and immorality, social injustice. Does that sound like the headlines today? We're in a sinful, sex-craved culture. I thought last season was bad. I think this season's gotten worse. If I see one more child on TV who's declaring to be a girl, although they're a boy, and a boy declaring to be a girl, I, it's driving me nuts. Amen. That represents 0.001% of the population, but it's being shoved down our throat like they're the majority. And every show has to have someone who's homosexual, every single one of them. And now it's gotten to where... It was in your window, and now, well, let's just all get up on the sofa together. And I'm going, there is absolutely nothing we can watch with our child on TV. So we go back 40 or 50 years, and we watch. So the other day, we gave up satellite. We cut the cable about a year and a half ago. We watched Hulu because we can pull up old, old shows. And old movies. And you know, and I look about and I, and I think about that because this culture, these people know, Hollywood knows that the more money they can crank out, the more airtime they get. And our kids, they're just speaking to our kids. They're, they're and they're speaking to you too. You may say, well, they haven't messed with me. Yeah, they have. They put you in debt over your eyelids. Because they have shown you that pickup truck. And that car that you're entitled to is so funny because Rebecca, we were watching the game yesterday. Man, you know, in the games, they're marketing men. Some women, they're kind of got more, you know, they understand that women are starting to watch football more, so there's a little bit of, but the, the, uh, the marketing is heavily weighted towards men. And they say, get this car because you deserve it. Rebecca looked over at me and she says, Dad, we deserve it. You know, like that. She was making fun of it because she's heard me say that that's what they're, you deserve this thing. You deserve this car. You deserve that car payment? Who put that on your back? <laughs> right? You deserve these things. They're yours for the take. You worked hard. You earned it. And then they're going to give you a credit card where you can earn 2% back. Now, they didn't tell you that your interest rate is 29%, but they're going to be your friend, and they're going to give you 2%. When does that work? Let me ask you another question. Let's think about Oprah and Donald Trump. Oprah Winfrey and Donald Trump are two of the most wealthy people in the world. How many of them have ever used their Capital One airline miles to travel? Rich people don't. Because I will tell you something. Rich people's not out there paying 29% on an interest rate thinking they're going to get 2% back. That's for the rest of us. And next thing you know, we got credit card debt, highest credit card debt in the history of America right now. 
It's unbelievable. Foreclosures on homes because people got in over their head. Or life has happened, things happen, and people don't save money anymore. <laughs> you can't. I, I, know, I don't know about y'all, but in the last four or five years, the dollar just doesn't even go any further than it did. It, it's worse now than it was. You go to the grocery store, and it's like filling out a loan paper. Oh, my lens. All I bought was two bags. And then you walk out of the store, and a little grocery goes, and she looks at you and goes, wow, that's a big deal. And um, she's like, well, I appreciate your, I brought in your stock options today. But what we what we buy is, you know, and Ben loves that. He works at Walmart. Walmart, spend the money, y'all. He smiles all the time. He smiles the whole time. He's like, every time we pull to Walmart, he's like, write the check, Andy, write the check. And uh, <laughs> but you think about it, all these companies they know, and they, and they have built into these things that where our self, our reliance can come upon ourselves, and our reliance can come everything outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it comes outside of the church. And, and, that, and that really is a form of what we're talking about, this apostasy. And Jesus said that this was going to happen. Because there's going to be a time of false teaching. And we're in it. We are in it. They may have been in it in the, in the first century because there's been false teaching out there since Jesus walked the planet. But man, it is out there now. And the difference between it now, whereas before it was on parchments, today it's by satellite. So the knowledge travels so much faster, which is what Daniel said was going to happen. When Daniel gave his word of prophecy about the books and about the end times, he said that information, he called it, he said people will go to and fro. And when you look at that more directly, he was talking about information. And I shared this with our youth the other day. Literally, Daniel was talking about the internet. Information going to and fro, and it's going to ever increase. And we will see that ever increase. And the more that information increases, the greater these false teachings can spread deeper. And there's money behind the false teaching. Because let me put it to you this way. The church's checkbook is not nearly as big as Hollywood's. But God's checkbook is bigger than Hollywood's. And what I'm saying is this. If the people of God will keep trusting in the Lord and not get caught up in these traps... Hollywood will have to bend the knee to the Lordship of Christ. But here we get bogged down. And so here Paul is told him, he says, listen guys, the rapture has not happened yet. Remember, he would also say, do not be ignorant of these things. He says, let me tell you, the, the, the rapture hasn't happened yet. He says, as a matter of fact, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and then you guys are going to go, don't worry about those who have died before. And man, he, he spent, these are two of the shortest letters, but they're chock full of unraveling false teaching. And I feel like many times, I, don't, I look at you guys, Sunday night, I consider to be the cream of the crop, so to speak. And that may be bad to say, please don't take that. What I'm saying is, I believe that when we're here on Sunday nights, it's just different. And when you're, we're together on Sunday morning as a pastor, and I've got 30 minutes to try to begin to unravel billions of dollars worth of marketing. Think about that. Because whether you realize or not, we have been programmed. From the moment you were born. Because we're now all, even you older folks, are still in the technological age. For the most part. Your 20s and 30s were spent at the advent of the technical age. You have worked at this point pretty much within the parameters of the technological age. And so with that has come a certain level of program. I was talking to a woman the other day. She says, you know what? I don't buy into all this junk that they're trying to tell us the kids are just born, born knowing how to use phones. She says the reason they know how to use phones is because you've shown them as a parent how to use that phone. They don't come out knowing how to tap a screen. They watch what you've done. You've taught them that. You've programmed them that. Don't blame it on the TV. And I was like, you know what, girl? You can preach that all day long. Don't blame it on everybody else. They watched you in your house. 
And we see that, and as, and as much as I told our kids, I said, as much as technology can do an amazing, be an amazing thing, it is also a dark thing. And if we have to be very careful as Christians that we stay focused on truth, and you know, one of the things of the truths of the word, and, and I kind of put together a list of what does backsliding, what does apostasy look like? Because you're dealing with false teachers. And Paul said there's going to be a man of fierceness and leadership. We know as the Antichrist. And in the midst of all this, the people of God are going to rebel against God. There's going to be a falling away. What does that look like? I put together a list. One, a denial of basic Christian doctrine. You know what? I believe we may, even in our church, need to do a series called Christianity 101. It amazes me. In this series, I've been preaching on the identity of Christ, our identity in Christ. Every single message has been on basic Christian doctrine. Every single one of them. They may look kind of fancy or sound different, but that's exactly what it is. And so many people have said, wow, that was awesome. Well, I really learned something today. It's basic Christian doctrine. Because we wander into the weeds somewhere. And as much as I look long for heaven, and I can't wait to get to heaven, we sometimes are so heavenly minded, we're no earthly good. And we look toward heaven and look over the people who are lost. We live at a time where the basic doctrine of Christ, people are saying, there are people in the church, there are 60% of church folks, church folks, who don't believe that the word of God is absolutely true. 60%. That's apostasy. That is a falling away. Another one that's not real popular is the ordination of homosexuals. We, boy, the Methodists have already said, look, we, we glitched on that one. Homosexuality is clearly condemned in God's word. We are to love them and lead them to Christ. We don't run from them, but we give them the word of God. They're just like any other sinner on this planet, just like we were before Christ. It just has a different label to it. But we're to love on them just the same. But when we start elevating people who are living a lifestyle blatantly against the word of God to levels of church leadership, there's a problem. This is another one that is not real popular around some schools. Women being pastors. The word of God does not say that women can be pastors. Can women be missionaries? Absolutely. And teachers, we've got it right here, right here in our church. My goodness, amazing women of God. And amazing teachers of the word of God in this church. But not pastors. Pastors, according to scripture, are to be men. And when you see denominations who have wandered from that, you begin to see a, a denomination that soon is a dead, died or dead denomination. We're seeing it. I was told by someone two weeks ago that I'm a member of a dying denomination. I said, well, why don't you jump over to one that I think is still thriving? Sometimes I wonder about Southern Baptists, I'll be honest with you. Because we sure had our issues in the last few months. We've had our head guy was involved in an affair. We've had, we've had pastors all over the country involved with affairs with piano players and Sunday school teachers and everything else. It has become so rampant in our own denomination that as a state level, we've had to implement a sexual... Uh, uh, deviancy policy, basically, at our, at our convention level last month. That is an apostasy. That is a slipping away. Not preaching the gospel is another one. And I'll say that till I'm blue in the face. Praise God. Somebody the other day said, you preach the word of God. I better preach the word of God because if I don't, I'm going to stand before God one day and give an account for it. And I got enough to give an account for for just doing something foolish. If my, okay, let me take, Randy, let me take. If you go into my office and you read my license and my ordination certificate, 
It does not say that I am licensed or ordained to preach the guidepost. It does not say that I'm licensed to preach the New York Times. It says the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when men laid hands on me in that building 20 years ago, that was the understood. I am to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come hell or high water. That's right. But it's not, as I said it this morning, we've got to get the bad news before we get the good news, right? We've got to understand the gospel and the great news of the gospel. Why don't we want to take that to people? We've got to take that to people. The gospel, the whole gospel, nothing but the gospel. That's right. So help us, God! As we're empowered by His Spirit. What about using the Lord's name in vain? Boy, that's become something. We were talking to one of Rebecca's teachers, fifth grade. And she said, one of the biggest issues I have in my class are kids using the F word. Like it's nothing, she said. What? Let me tell you what would happen at 235. Back in the day, it was Route 9, Box 630. If even the hint of that word had reportedly come out of this face, I would have been dismembered two streets back. Read away. That's right. That's right. I don't even know if they'd break out the soap for that, but I think it'd just be a beat, and that's just all it would be. In the wood. Let me tell you something about my mom and dad. One time, oh, me and my nephew, we got into trouble. And they brought psychological punishment onto the property. We had to go cut our own switch. Y'all remember ever having to do that? I heard somebody say one time, I had to cut my own switch. And you gonna, you want to get one that's not too little or they'll just send you back for another one. And you don't want one too big because they might break you back with it. So you got to find one just right. We had a cherry tree. Man, I'm glad that thing died. <laughs> but we had a cherry tree, and that I, I remember one time my mama. Y'all see, y'all don't know my mama back when my mama was okay. What I gotta say, she chased us through the yard with that switch, finally wore us down and wore us out. Taking the Lord's name in vain. We got preachers who just are cussing everywhere. I'll never be. We got cussing preachers in the pulpit. That's a, that's another new one that I've been reading about. Oh, we'll just throw it out there. Well, that's how the world talks. We're trying to reach the world. Oh, yes, you're trying to reach the world, but you don't look and sound like the world while you're doing it. Amen. Not sending out or failing to support missionaries. Man, I'm telling you right there. That's one thing when we look at the budget of the church, we're like, we don't cut. Because I believe what T.E. Gaskin said as one of the founding fathers of this church right here in Down Park. He said, if you ever stop giving the missions, you're done. And I'll tell you, two weeks before that man died, I was in his nursing home room, and I told him then that this church would continue supporting missions. Pastors who are more concerned about growing a church and preaching the truth. Kind of like we were talking about a few minutes ago. But, you know, hey, like I said, it's what Christmas or Spurgeon said, a monkey can draw a crowd, but only the Holy Spirit can build a congregation. Pastors, we've got to stand for the Word of God. We have to. What about those who don't pray to seek faith? Man, I'll tell you what, I better have been prayed up and read up before I get up here. Because you want to talk about a monkey, you'll have one up here. I never will forget one time. Still in old church. I was like, ooh, young in ministry. I got all this. And I never will forget. I had no more prayed or studied over that message than anything. I got up in that pulpit and I was ready to roll. I told that poor old church, opened up your Bibles. I don't even remember what it was. I looked down at my Bible and I couldn't read any of it. How many of you have ever done one of them word scramble puzzles? That's exactly what my Bible looked like. I'm sitting there, um, 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 let us pray. Um, you know, I, ten minutes. And this is what I heard, just as clear as I'm talking to you right now. If you ever try to do this without me, you'll be happy. Mm. You better know that I'm ready to pray up before I get to this pulpit. Or any pulpit. Some people say you step on my toes. Well, 
let me tell you something. He stepped on mine before he could ever get to yours. <laughs> Pastors who fail to equip their congregations for ministry. I don't want that to be me. I told y'all today, I believe we got one of the best Sunday school pharmacists on the calendar. I really believe that. We got some amazing teachers in this church. We got people in this church that have lived life and ministry in amazing ways. And you know what? I, I love seeing what they're doing. I just wish more of our folks would get plugged into them. I like this one. I got this one out of the book. Preachers who don't teach damnation. Woo, you don't hear that word anymore, do you? I used to have one somebody say, I'll tell you what, he's a fire and brimstone preacher. You don't hear about fire. That was the old days, fire and brimstone. Oh, no, let me tell you. When I go out and preach for a Bible, I'm going to preach about hell as much as heaven, because Jesus sure did. We need to talk about damnation. We don't have to preach it all the time. The world does need to hear that there's another side to heaven. And that if you don't know Jesus, you go in there with a one-way ticket. Christians gathering teachers to themselves. We're going to talk about this next week. That make them feel good. Oh, I, I would, I would, I would, I'll tell you what. Paul, Moses, Jesus, or none of them would be welcome in most pulpits and churches today. Isn't that right? You should see... Some of these churches, with the uh, you, through the convention, I'll see some of the churches. They'll say what they're looking for in pastor. I'm like, what? You don't want to see you. They want a CEO and a CFO and a COO, not a preacher. They want somebody who can balance spreadsheets, right? Maybe wrote a book. They want all that. They don't even ask what they're saying. That's one of the questions. Like, Are you saved? It's like one of those things you go to ordain somebody. I'm so glad if it's not me, somebody else says, before we get started, are you saved? And they look at you like you developed a third eye, but you can't assume anything anymore. I tell you, I've known people who were called into ministry. Two months later, you end up at the Holiday Inn, which is where they should have started with to begin with. And the last one, this one's huge. And this may seem totally out of the whack, but evolution. Evolution. The teaching of evolution is the single greatest threat to the foundational truths of Christianity today. Because we have a school, and now we have we have even churches, we have denominations that are preaching the Big Bang Theory. They are preaching evolution. They are not preaching a literal 6,000 years. They're not preaching the flood. They're not bringing evidences into the pulpit, in front of the pulpit, to say, this is what the world says about evolution, but this is what the Bible says about creation. And what happens was we say, well, how, why is evolution so important? Because what our evolution does is it devalues human life. When they can convince you that you've come from nothing but a little mud pond bug or a monkey, you're not going to realize your potential. And that's exactly what the devil wants you to believe. See, the devil knows that you're made in the image and likeness of God. So he's going to try to make you think that you are paramecium or amoeba somewhere in pines, in, in the pond stump, or your cousins were hanging from trees by their tails. That's what he's going to make you believe, because he knows what we are. He knows what we are. And what happens with evolution is all of a sudden now, when you see more and more teaching of evolution, you see more and more abortions. Because we've devalued human life. See, evolution is not just about debunking God. It is debunking created life by God. And I will tell you this, and I will see it, I believe, before my life is over. Before, as, as people are aborting children left and right, it is only a matter of time before they're going to look over the senior landscape and say, are you more of a cost to us than a benefit? Trust me. It's happening already, but it's only going to get worse. I'm telling you. And this is the reason why we have got to make sure as churches we preach creation and we preach the value of life that we are created in the image and likeness of God every chance we get. Because that has a huge effect. That has a huge impact on the church. Because ultimately it's all said and done. I go back to my life verse here. Romans 1.16. Apostle Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, 
to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. But you know what? When we see apostasy in our churches, they're ashamed of the gospel. Because they believe that there's another gospel that will save us. They believe that there's another Jesus. Or they believe that there's another method. Or that they believe that there's another way or another program. Let me tell you, only Jesus Christ and him crucified and him risen is what we need to be preaching. And that's what we're going to be teaching. And I'll tell you what, we're not, we're not going to slide back, are we? We're not, we're not going to backslide, are we? We're not going to be accused of fun. Man, I want to stand strong. I want to be there when Paul says, stand firm, stand strong. And I'll tell you this right now, and I'm closing. I'm sorry, I'm going a little over. I want to thank you, senior adults out there. Hey. Senior adults. I'm not, I, I'm a whippersnapper. We've got whippersnappers. Senior adults. I want to, I am blessed had you in my ministry. And I am even doubly blessed to see over these years that I've been talking about tonight, you have stood faithful. Because you had, you've had every opportunity to turn your back on Christ as any other group has. It may seem a little easier in the 50s. But the 60s came along and could have derailed a lot of you. And I'm not saying that all of you are perfect, because none of us are. But now you're here in the fall of your years. Now you're here at the end of the end of year. You're at, you are. You're, you're a senior adult. The golden years. And I am proud to say to your pastor, I am proud of you. I'm proud of you for standing strong. And I'm proud of you because I get to see you. And our kids and our young adults here get to see you. And get to be with you. And get to have you invest in us as we hopefully invest in you. Because that's what the local church is all about. I think of men like Luke and Gerald and Evan and Keith. These are men that have spoken to my life. And I want to thank you. I want to thank them for their faithfulness. And I want to thank you all for your faithfulness. But we got a long way to go. And we're not done. And a short time to get there. We're not done until Jesus comes again. So let's stand firm, as Paul said. Knowing that there are teachers out there. There are going to be men with itching ears, but that is not us. We're above that in Christ. We stay focused, as Peter said. We stay, we stay fit and faithful unto ministry, as Peter said, until the Lord calls us home. Because we are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood. We are the people of God, saved and redeemed by his blood. And in that, no one can take away. To God be the glory forever. Amen. Father, we love you and thank you for your word tonight. God, we thank you. For the encouragement as a people. We thank you, Lord, for who you are and who we are in Christ. And Lord, I just thank you for the men and women here in this church who bless me and bless the local church. And Father God, the, the, the workers and the servers and everything that happens, the teachers, everything that it takes at the local church. And Father, my prayer is that we will stay faithful, we will stay strong in you. That we'll continue to grow in you each and every day. Always mindful that our lives are to serve you and worship you in spirit and in truth. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. All of God's people say, Amen. 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 Amen